Welcome to the Regents Roundtable. I'm Stephen Ludwig. My guest today is Michael Polyakov. Dr. Polyakov is the president of the American Council of Trustees and Alumni. ACTA is an independent nonprofit organization dedicated to promoting academic excellence, academic freedom, and accountability at America's colleges and universities. He previously served as vice president for academic affairs and research at the University of Colorado and in senior roles at the National Endowment for the Humanities, the National Council on Teacher Quality, the American Academy for Liberal Education, and the Pennsylvania Department of Education. He received his BA from Yale University and went on to study at Oxford University as a Rhodes Scholar and the University of Mich Michigan, where he earned his PhD in classical studies. He's the author of numerous books and journal articles in classical studies and educational policy and has received the American Philological Association's Excellence in Teaching Award and the Pennsylvania Department of Education's Distinguished Service to Education Award. He has taught at Georgetown University, George Washington University, Hillsdale College, and the University of Illinois at Chicago, as well as Wellesley College. On top of all that, I've been fortunate enough to call Michael a friend for the past 15 years. Dr. Polyakov, welcome. Great seeing you today. Stephen, thank you. It's great to see you. Let's let's use our, um, our our familiar names. We've been friends for a very very long period, and I, I'm going to return the compliment by saying how much I admired you in your role as a regent of the University of Colorado. Um, you were brave. You didn't take anything on faith. You gathered the data. You were willing to challenge the assumptions. And that's what we need from our regents and our trustees, or as they're called in Virginia, boards of visitors. Uh, they have to be discerning, well-informed fiduciaries, and you really modeled that. And I, I, I was was very, very proud to to work with you. Well, you're very kind, and uh, I didn't uh, have you on here for that, but I'll take it. How's that? Okay. <laughs> let's uh, let's jump into something really simple. I want to start with a a really softball question for you. So let's talk about free speech on campus. <laughs> the popular and the trade press are filled with stories of speakers getting uninvited to speak on campus and faculty being censored or driven out due to unpopular views. What are some concrete steps you think that tree, uh, trustees, regents, governors, visitors can do to ensure that their campus can be a place where ideas are freely debated? First of all, make sure that we get out of the denial mode, that this is not a problem, or if it's a problem, it's a problem in somebody else's backyard, not on our campus. Uh, in other words, trustees, regents have to be proactive. And th the survey data um, it is so very compelling. When we look at surveys that ACTA has done, other organizations have done, the, the level of student self-censorship, the breakdown in the kinds of communications that move people forward, uh, all of that is, is quite apparent. So first rule, no denial, um, be proactive. So what, what does that mean? Uh, here are some best practices. Commit to a culture of free expression. If the faculty, are hesitant to adopt the Chicago principles or a similarly strong statement of um, commitment to freedom of expression, then the board can do it. It's a policy issue. And ensure that those principles make their way into student codes of conduct, faculty handbook, so that they're going to be enforceable. Uh, and I, I hate to say this because it sounds so draconian, but be willing to punish. It is important that when such a key principle of the academy is violated, that the sanctions are known to everybody. Otherwise, these things will continue. A school will quite properly dismiss a faculty member for plagiarism or a student for plagiarism. How much more egregious? is it when an invited speaker is put to silence or in some cases e even physically threatened so the school's got to be really quite clear about those policies but that's only the top down more important is changing the culture create a respect for the free exchange of ideas 
sponsor campus debates. ACTA has teamed up with the Braver Angels and the Bridge USA Foundations to sponsor and help facilitate campus debates. We've done over 80 of them. And what's remarkable is to see college students take up a question like Confederate monuments or assault weapons or universal health care and to do it uniformly with no shouting, no incivility. The adults need to pay attention to this. <laughs> and, and trustees and regents should show their appreciation, not just by sponsoring these things, but by coming and observing and participating. It's very heartwarming at these debates to see a college president or a provost come and observe, and e even more so to become involved in the discussion. Uh, the handmaiden of respect for freedom of expression is intellectual diversity. And that means that the school should be very, very active in making sure that there are heterodox opinions on campus. Uh, I would even like to see this drilling down to job searches. It's not okay to have a search committee made up of Caucasian males. Why is it okay to do a search for an economist without representation from classical liberalism or from conservative point of view? Schools have got to get proactive about that because otherwise they become a monoculture in which people's prejudices are reinforced. Um, break down the barriers to free expression. If there's a biased response team, get rid of it. Don't allow elements on campus to intimidate and stifle free speech. And finally, leadership accountability. When there's a search for a president or a provost, it ought to be an important question. What's your track record on promoting free speech and intellectual diversity? So there's a short list of things. That, yeah, I'm sure we could go on. That's a, that's a very good list. Um, and all very interesting. And I think most of us that love higher education, love the idea of um, various thoughtful voices being heard. And sometimes we need to hear less thoughtful voices, but the idea of debates and the open, the marketplace of ideas is certainly the ideal of what a college and university should be. You mentioned the Chicago principles. Can you uh, walk us through what those are without having to read the whole, <laughs> read the whole thing? <laughs> it's actually a very short and very elegant uh -huh. uh, statement. Uh, this is the work that came from the leadership of Robert Zimmer at University of Chicago and uh, Jeffrey Stone, who from the law school, who headed the um, committee. And it, it makes it very clear that the remedy for things that you don't like to hear is civil argumentation, that it is not OK when one finds an opinion to be objectionable to try to silence it. That is the absolute core of these things. And it notes that the university has had a long, long history of cultivating and protecting heterodox opinion. That is an operating principle that has to be there. Otherwise, we are simply shutting down all of the engines of progress. Yeah, that the, the Chicago principles, uh, I've read them. I think uh, when I was a regent, we adopted a version of those uh, for the University of Colorado. And I don't, per, I never saw what the controversy was around them. I, I think they're fairly straightforward. And, um, but again, that's my maybe a, a very biased opinion about that. And they're simple. Other than the University of Chicago, do you have other examples of institutions that are doing a pretty good job of keeping speech yes. uh, active on campus? Yes, indeed, there are good examples. But I, I just want to dwell a little bit more on the, on, uh, on the Chicago principles. The argument against them that somehow free speech is a tool for silencing the disenfranchised is such arrant nonsense. And the great I don't think you, I don't think you have a strong opinion about that. No. <laughs> <laughs> Keep please continue. Errant nonsense. When we listen to the great leaders who have advanced minority rights, like John Lewis, on um, I, I, I won't quote him, as, quote, quote, quote him as eloquently as he spoke, but uh, 
he said that the civil rights movement without free speech would have been a bird without wings. Well, let's listen to that for heaven's sake. Uh, Jonathan Rauch, who was uh, one of the pioneers of LGBTQ rights, uh, is adamant about this. He's at the Brookings Institution, that this is the only way that we advance things that in one era are unpopular, they become the truths of another time. I, I should uh, I, stop me if I'm nattering on, but for me, one of the very moving moments on, the, on my recent trip to Italy with my family was standing in front of the statue of Giordano Bruno in the Campo del Fiore uh, at the spot in 1600 where he was burned alive. Why? Because he advanced heliocentric views of the universe and other things that the dominant culture at the time, which was the church, disapproved of. Uh, and of course, we know uh, how Galileo was bullied into submission, not so much later. Can we learn from these things? Scientific progress as well, so often <clears throat> is a matter of pushing the frontiers, taking something that everybody else says isn't there and being willing to explore it. If we want to advance as a culture, if we want to advance our science and technology, we have to cultivate freedom of speech. Sorry, I'm getting off on a little that's, bit of a that's good. No, I mean, it's it's important to hear the passion behind it because a lot of times uh, when we don't have a moment to sit down with thoughtful people, we can fall back on talking points we heard that hadn't quite thought through and didn't give that some consideration. And so having a passion, uh, explore, exploring that idea passionately and why that means so much is an important reminder in a thoughtful way. So I think, I think that's a good reminder for all of us of why these things are so important. One of the things that we have to be cautious of as, as board members, regents, trustees, what have you, is not throwing gas on the social media fire when these things flare up, because that just makes it worse. Are there things that board members can do to not make a, a delicate situation worse? Sure. And I, I, I will back up a little bit. A big part of that is the prevention, which comes from building a proper culture where students, where faculty would embrace the opportunity to hear opinions that differ from theirs. And that means their participation, their modeling of the behavior, uh, their support for orientation programs like the one that Purdue University has, where students from their very first day on campus are exposed to the ethic of the school which is to explore and to exchange ideas. Christopher Newport University did it very well. The, um, the president had a series of town meetings to work with the faculty to develop uh, a sense of support for the modification, um, I should say the adoption of the Chicago principles um, in a form that was very much in keeping with their university. It's important that trustees and regents not be reactive, but be proactive. Uh, social media is an extremely poor platform for ideas. <laughs> <laughs> I don't understand. <laughs> and uh, getting out in front as problems are brewing um, is so important to make those statements, to provide good alternatives for people who feel that they are offended and mm -hmm. perhaps to um, try to uh, elim eliminate the culture of offense. The remedy for speech you don't like is, as others wiser than I have said, is more speech. Yeah. And we even have a good example of that in um, what Lee Bollinger did when um, somebody on his campus, I can't really remember the genesis of this, invited Mahmoud Ahmadinejad to speak. Um, a pretty so hard... How, so, yeah, so he's he was the prime minister or president of Iran. Iran. Right? And um, then what's what's the campus we're speaking of? We're talking about Colombia. Okay, great. Yeah, yeah. Uh, 
pretty horrifying figure, um, uh, Holocaust denier, anti-Semite, um, anti-gay, you know, all the things that are very much um, uh, averse to our culture. So what does Bollinger do? He said, ah, I'm going to introduce him. <laughs> and he spends 10 minutes taking apart the Ahmadinejad program, um, left the guy really quite flat-footed. Um, that's a perhaps an unusual situation, but the, the ability to be agile without silencing is very, very important and not mm -hmm. to let the problem get out of hand. Great. I think that's great advice and some great examples. Uh, switching gears slightly, because I think this is related. One of the areas that ACTA focuses on is ensuring that colleges and universities have a robust uh, curriculum around civics. Now, uh, I've been an elected official, so you know I personally believe that having a healthy democracy, we need to understand its philosophical underpinnings historical context, how it works, and how to engage in our democratic institution as an active citizen. That's certainly my point of view. So when we talk about civics, and it's like, especially if you're going to a public institution, having a requirement from civics seems like a no-brainer, but I know I'm, I might be in the minority on that. Why has ACTA decided to make civics one of its key issues? Because the alternative is so horrible. <laughs> <laughs> and and the, the horror is already upon us. Um, yeah. the, um, the level of civic illiteracy is, is shocking. Uh, survey after survey, we find that not just Americans in general, but college graduates know so little about their country, its institutions of government. Uh, just to pull one of the um, data points from, from our surveys, um, more than 50% of college graduates cannot reliably on a multiple choice survey identify the term lengths of members of Congress. Um, they, it's not a flunkeroo. They don't have to think originally. They just have to be able to say six and two. And given that, what generation is coming up that is so ignorant of how that key element of American government works. And um, e even more so, what does it mean for their participation in a free society? Um, so I find that apocalyptically dangerous. And we have other, other findings that are funny um, in a sort of tragicomic <laughs> way. <laughs> Let's hear it. When 10% um, of the uh, college graduates we interviewed uh, thought that um, uh, uh, Judy Scheindlin, otherwise known as Judge Judy, sat on the Supreme Court. They oh uh, they ticked her name. Um, and um, in an, another question, 15% thought that Brett Kavanaugh was the Chief Justice, with um, an even larger number uh, thinking that it was Antonin Scalia, although he'd been dead for three years. Um, this is, I shouldn't say funny. Uh, this is really tragic. And I was thinking about this even more so. There, there was a poll done by um, Quinnipiac University recently, and one of the questions they asked was, would you stay and fight the way the Ukrainians are fighting if your nation was invaded? And I believe it was 38% of the respondents said no. And the figure was particularly high for the younger age group. I, it made me think back to something that John Kennedy said, um, which I, I find so very beautiful. There's little that is more important for an American citizen to know than the history and traditions of his country. They hadn't really gotten onto um, pro proper pronouns at the time, but we'll go on. Um, without such knowledge, he stands uncertain and defenseless before the world, knowing neither where he has come from nor where he is going. Without, with such knowledge, he is no longer alone, but draws a strength far greater than his own from the cumulative experience of the past and a cumulative vision of the future. Lord, spare us. We need this. Mm -hmm. We need this desperately. And when we see these polls that show that um, so many younger adults don't think it's important to live in a democracy uh, at a time when democracy is under threat. 
uh, I am very, very worried yeah. and so very impatient of the um, tripe that we get from too many college leaders that our students already know this. We don't, we, we don't need to um, have a required course. So they can take one of those interesting electives like uh, Miley Cyrus or Harry Potter or zombies mm -hmm. and vampires. I'm not exaggerating. No, <laughs> but, I, I'm yeah, well aware. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that, um, this is something that we feel really quite urgent about. Well, my, I would go, and again, you know, I can't, we can't wave, wave our magic wand. I'd be willing to give a pass on someone if they couldn't name the chief justice of the Supreme Court, if they could name their local state representative and their lo local state senator or their city council. Again, young people aren't in, as engaged traditionally because they're for a number of reasons, but that local government thing that's my background obviously but um you know has such an impact on our day-to-day -day lives and people are just clueless on how to get a hold of a city council member if they need help there let alone lobby a, a member of congress on a issue of national importance well the term there is civic disempowerment mm -hmm. and when people in a democracy are disempowered it becomes all the more tempting to use violence or coercive measures. So we, we've got some real threats and colleges and universities ha have been derelict in their obligations. Uh, and it, here again, I would call on trustees and regents um, to stop taking things on faith. Do some surveys. What is the level of civic and historical knowledge on campus? Stop listening to dog and pony shows that are conveniently provided so that they'll go off blissfully um, ignorant of what the situation might be. Um, I, I have great respect for the legislatures that have begun to, like Florida and South Carolina, say no more. Our public institutions will have such a course. But so much better when the institution itself remembers its responsibility. Uh, Arizona Board of Regents did this. Uh, I, I would call upon every trustee, every regent, every visitor to do the same. This is not an abrogation of academic freedom. This is not an intrusion into the classroom. It is the setting of policy, policy on behalf of mm -hmm. our nation. Well, this leads into a great question. Um, most higher education institutions have this idea of shared governance, which has its strengths and its weaknesses, where the faculty have control over the academic side of the house. And I found out personally, as you know, some of the stories, the hard way, trying to force faculty something to do something is usually very counterproductive. It's usually better to figure out how to do something with faculty. How do you think board members can constructively work with their administration, their institution's administration and faculty leaders to ensure that there's a robust civics program, there's free speech, there's a solid core curriculum. Respect for academic freedom is what separates us from um, somebody like Viktor Orban. <laughs> let's, be, let's be real. Yeah, he's um, shutting down universities in Hungary. Yeah, yeah. exactly. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that means that um, governance does not uh, interfere in the classroom. That's the business of the professor, the department chair, the dean. On the other hand, setting policy is very much the role of the fiduciary. And that grows best from conversation. So one builds on the expertise of faculty, but let's get the shared back into shared governance. Um, it, it is a grave mistake for an academic affairs committee and a board to say, that's not our business. The business of the institution is teaching and learning and advancing the frontiers of knowledge. So to say that we will ensure that students leave with the building blocks of understanding what it means to be an American citizen is entirely their role. Um, and 
that can be done in a collegial process of discussion, but it has to be done. And ultimately, the board is responsible for the health of the institution. Uh, these things need to happen. And they, they cannot be a free for all. There, there have to be some guidelines and guardrails. Uh, I, I, I don't think that in any way abrogates shared governance. It does not abrogate academic freedom. Um, it does call on the board to be responsible. The, the board, after all, is a unique interface. The board members are the ones who have the reach into business, industry, government, um, into employment sectors. And they bring a particular knowledge. They answer to the public. I remember actually a podcast that you did with us. Um, whom does the uh, university trustee serve? And you answered immediately without hesitation, the public. Serves the public through the institution. And that that's, means- that's not, a, that's not a very widely held view, but thank you. That I feel very strongly about that myself. Yeah, obviously. It, it, it is an essential viewpoint mm -hmm. and it doesn't in any way um, obstruct the um, advancement of knowledge in the university. So um, one of the, a lot of colleges, uh, trustees or regents or what have you work at small institutions and you're a professor of the classics, which focuses on Greco-Roman culture, which is a critical uh, area of study, full stop, but it's steadily shrinking. And as colleges and universities face increased pressure on budgets, what are some strategies they might use to save low enrollment programs like the classics? Important question. And I'm gonna start actually with a little advertisement of- Please. Um, one of ACTA's resources, which is called HowCollegesSpendMoney.com. Um, it's a free site, even though it's called .com. And what we've done is to take all of the data that the federal government collects from colleges and universities, the spending data, um, and put it into a very friendly um, user interface so that with a few keystrokes, anyone, whether that's a board member or a legislator or an administrator or a faculty member or a parent, can see what the ratio is between expenditure on administration and instruction or student services and instruction, and can then see how that measures up against the peers of the institution. And that can be the basis for some really good conversations. Uh, there's a lot. Let me let me stop you there. So I think that's a great tool, um, and I'll put the the website link in the show notes of how just to to get more information to ask smart questions. So I don't know what why are we spending more on this particular thing than most of our other peers? Do we have something special going on, or is this an area to look at? I'm, I, you know, that level of curiosity can really, I, I just want to emphasize the point, like can create great conversations. And that's exactly the right word. Uh, we are humble in the implications of what that data shows. Um, but uh, we really do insist that um, the conversation take place. Uh, and, and, and that's often the beginning of wisdom, to use a biblical phrase. Uh, we've had schools um, sometimes get a little prickly uh, about these findings and then come back and say, okay, we are overspending on executive level administration. Uh, and that's all to the best. The tool was not created as a club. It was created as a transparency device. So I, I, I preface uh, answering your question about low enrollment programs with uh, that, that there really needs to be great scrutiny about how money is being used. There are some very creative ideas out there. Form consortia. Schools are very bad at cooperating with each other. As that's, a gro that's, a gro that's a gross understatement, but thank you. Yes. Yeah, even the campuses of a single institution. Oh, it's just terrible. It's it's if it's not built here, it's no good. Yeah, uh, you know, this is my tree house. It's the best mm -hmm. one. 
And um, I'm not <laughs> at all away. interested in yeah, yeah. <laughs> what's happening at your church house. But um, we are seeing some examples of institutions basically leveraging each other's strengths. Um, it's um, expensive to run a low enrollment program, but that program in many cases is absolutely crucial to the academic excellence of the institution. So join with other schools in the same position. We have these extraordinary platforms for interactive video. One of my favorites is the um, shared course initiative, uh, Columbia, Yale, Cornell, not exactly poor schools, um, discovered that it, it's really not very effective either intellectually or financially to have programs in Dutch, Nahuatl, um, Cantonese. Um, so they created a virtual classroom in which all the students in real time on three different campuses are sitting around the same table seeing each other on the screen. And language acquisition is really, really good in that environment. Um, having taught the old way, I was very pleased to hear that. So let's get creative about doing this. State System of Higher Education in Pennsylvania was doing this with courses like Chinese and Arabic, vastly increasing opportunities for their students. And there are things that have to be worked out what part of tuition goes to which campus, so forth and so on. But let's get it done and stop pretending that we can only diminish our offerings, often in a popularity contest rather than in a, a real intellectual way. Well, um, it's, a, it's a revenue, you know, if I just look at revenue, revenue, revenue all the time. And there's a balance. Look at public institutions, especially, and private ones. What do we need to do to make sure that we're we have that robust offering? But what how are we also being responsible? But I love this idea of I don't know, cooperate with each other. You have Italian, I have German, someone else has Cantonese. Let's share resources like those three colleges you mentioned. I think that's that's brilliant. Are there other strategies that I mean that sounds like the most no-brainer one? I, I I cannot. Well, I understand yeah. why it hasn't happened. Uh, that does not reflect well <laughs> on higher education. Yeah. Um, but we've got to get over it. And so one of my what I'm sorry. One of my arguments about this type of challenge, we have by default the smartest people on the planet on our payrolls, and if we wanted to figure something out, we could. It's a matter of political, not Democrat, Republican political, but small p political will to like, how do we get that done? And then how do we fight academic culture to ensure that we can get that done? Because I like we have all the brain power we need to figure this stuff out. That's never the issue. Yes. And we need as a whole institution by institution to be an academic community. And that means more than turf battles. Uh, it, it means that the biology department has to think beyond the production of biology majors. And whether it's the dance department or the classics department or the physics department, all of them need to think about what it means to produce an educated graduate of the institution in a a person who's ready for career and citizenship. And that means giving up a little bit. We, we haven't gotten to the question of um, core curriculum and priorities, but that really is a key part of the conversation. Um, but I, I wanna talk a little bit more though to answer your question about um, keeping important programs alive. Uh, ironically, um, it's a kind of Colorado um, building that puts it out right in front of us, right, right on the Norlin Library is um, Cicero's statement, not to know what happened before you were born is to be a child forever. Um, and to be cutting off classics at the roots is something that just seems so destructive. Now, of course, Norlin was a um, himself a professor of Greek, yeah. but uh, he was also the person who had the courage to stare down the Ku Klux Klan. 
So you know. this was the George Norlin was the president of the University of Colorado for 35 years. Um, yeah, in, including the 30s that uh, Michael's mentioning. Please continue. Yeah, uh, sorry, I should have um, been a, a good teacher and not skip the uh, <laughs> the introduction. Um, leadership in a college or university can model the kind of intellectual behavior that tends to encourage the serious pursuit of not just antiquity, but civilization in general. Uh, you may remember that program that we had, The Challenge of a Free Society. Um, it, it started with the Apology of Socrates, Plato's Apology of Socrates, and it ended with Martin Luther King's letter from Birmingham jail. Um, the past was present for Martin Luther King in that jail. He knew from memory important parts of Plato, of Martin Buber, the course of the Bible. And when someone finally gave him a pencil and some paper, he writes this extraordinary document. Uh, we need academic leaders who steep themselves, who model this behavior. If you go into a chancellor or a provost's office and you don't see a lot of books, you see a bunch of um, trophies and painted footballs, you know you got a problem. <laughs> <laughs> so know. let's, um, so there's, uh, we're, if, if it's okay with you, we're gonna go a, bit, a little bit longer than I normally go. Is that all right with your totally. time? I'm, okay. It's great to see you. I'm enjoying the conversation. Thank you. So, um, so outside of your background as a classics professor, I think a lot of board members are going to, they're business people. They're like, if no one wants this, why are we doing it? And so this is that combination of mission service. You know, it's a broader mission than just a, a market one. Although, you know, uh, we need to take demand into account. Why do you think saving these small enrollment programs through through consortia or other means is important for a campus? Or the country, for that matter. Uh, the last time I looked at the figures, um, people between the age of 18 and 42, I think it was, on average changed jobs about 11 times. Some of, the, some of those will be small changes within a particular office, but some of them will be career changes. And to believe that by, cha by training somebody for a job, you're actually preparing that person for a dynamic and uh, pretty unrelenting and unforgiving global marketplace is just a fantasy. And so in purely pragmatic terms, uh, a liberal arts background, and when I say liberal arts, that means science, math, foreign language, as well as humanities, um, to fail to equip students with that is really an act of malfeasance, to make them think that simply by being ready to get that job in the corporation that everything's gonna be okay. That's not education. And I would think that business leaders who are in touch with their HR offices know that. So I, I, I don't feel at all apologetic about looking for the resources that keep these intellectually important, albeit sadly, sometimes under-enrolled programs going. And I, I dare say with better academic organization and a better marshalling of resources for the core curriculum, there would be far more demand for the kinds of programs that these, these departments could offer. Whatever happened to these shared courses, these, um, these group efforts between departments, I think that gets back to our earlier <laughs> discussion of uh, failure of academic leadership and a uh, breakdown of cooperation. There are some schools do these extraordinary team taught efforts, drawing on the best of, of different units. We need to get back to that. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. You brought up a few times um, core curriculum. ACTA has created a scorecard on colleges and universities around that called What Will They Learn? Can you, what, what is a core curriculum? I know that's a very basic question, but I just want to make sure everyone understands it. What's the scorecard? Why do you develop it? What are some of the issues? That's yeah, about, it, that's four questions in one. Good luck with that. Okay. <laughs> in 2009, we started uh, a project called um, What Will They Learn? And the title is a little polemical. Don't tell me about the... Um, party life on campus. Don't tell me about um, how much money you have in your endowment or um, your, your alumni or any of the other status and wealth things, how many students you reject um, in, in the applicant pool. Tell us what will they learn? What will all of them in the um, College of Liberal Arts or whatever we call it, what will they learn? And in consultation with our Council of Scholars, we came upon seven, we decided there were seven core subjects, not the only ones, it's a floor, not a ceiling, mm -hmm. but that every college student should have a strong course in composition, should have an experience in reading literature. And again, we don't just say it's European literature, American literature, it could be any literature, but to really wrestle with difficult texts learn how to read critically. Every student should go at least to the intermediate level in foreign language. And here I'm going to pause. I get really, really prickly when I see a college catalog that talks about global citizenship and multiculturalism and doesn't have a serious foreign language requirement. Let's stop acting like ugly Americans and pretending that our borders are Canada and Mexico. Our borders are every airport in the United States and to not to give students that experience of walking the walk of somebody else's language is simply just doing diversity on the cheap. Okay. So <laughs> get <back. laughs> again, I'm not, I'm not sure if you have strong feelings about this stuff. No. <laughs> um, Please uh, continue. American, American history yeah. government course, a oh, course in economics. I, think of how bad the situation is oh. now. And only yeah. less than 3% of the colleges and universities have a requirement for economics. That's dysfunctional. And then a, a um, college level math course, not warmed over arithmetic or you know, uh, some excuse for that. And then finally, a, um, a course in, in natural science. And that we, we determined uh, with consultation of our, our faculty advisors to be th the floor. Now, what do we find? Um, only um, about 2% of our schools can get six or more of those. Um, and um, most have three or less, which is absolutely terrifying. And we see the fruit of this. When we look at something like the National Assessment of Adult Literacy, um, it hasn't been repeated since 2003, I think, um, the Department of Education must have decided to shoot the messenger because. The <laughs> <laughs> um, but a four year college graduate, on average, um, this is the average four year college graduate, cannot reliably distinguish viewpoints in two different editorials, cannot reliably compute the cost of food per ounce. I kept reading that over and over again when I saw those findings. That can't be true. But um, this was the repetition of the 1992 survey. That's why I think they must have shot the messenger. Um, so what are schools doing? When we look at the OECD, the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development findings, we have the second highest expenditure per pupil, that's public and private money, in the world. Uh, Luxembourg edges us out a little bit on spending. And yet, when we look at these international comparisons of core collegiate skills, we're a little bit below average. So like the kids at the football game, we can put our finger in the air and say we're number one, well, we're number two in spending. We're, we're not getting value for money. And a big part of that is the breakdown in general education liberal arts core curriculum. 
So th this has been a passion for us. We now mm -hmm. review over 1,100 schools every year, each one um, fresh, um, fresh review to see if anything has changed. And uh, we, we celebrate when schools will add a core requirement. We give them technical advice to help them um, really fix up a core curriculum for the benefit of their students, benefit of everybody. Why? Um, uh, so there, I've, I'm sorry, I was writing two. I have two questions and both are big. Um, so part of this comes down to the fundamental question. What does it mean to be an educated adult at, with a call with a university degree, college or university degree, and who gets to decide? So that's um, tricky. Um, and, and it's a fascinating conversation that we, I'd never had that at the board level. We never brought that up. And the core curriculum conversation almost demands that answer as well as the civics conversation we had, because you and I agreed if, if we were running the world, we'd require civics so people could know that the, the government in the country they're working in and how it works. Um, why do you think colleges and universities got away from a core curriculum. Now, Brown University, uh, Ivy League that people spend gobs of money to go to, I don't know if they still do, but they famously had no curriculum at all, right? And so they people came out of there just fine. Uh, but, you know, when you, when you send in brilliant students, you tend to get brilliant students out. Um, anyway, sorry, there's a lot of thoughts there. How, why do you think we've gotten away from this idea of a solid core curriculum that no, these are just some basic blocking and tackling that you have to do when you come to a college or university. Some of it is ideological. Um, that's to say there's something a little um, uh, regimented about a core at a time when there's a real resistance to what I would call adult leadership. Uh, others might have other <laughs> names for it. The, the idea that the college or university has a um, collection of experts with expert knowledge, and they ought to be able to set some priorities for learning. That's um, unfortunately not happening, and some of that, again, is an ideological breakdown. Another is, I think, the consumerism, the, the, the fear of actually doing things that might, might discourage enrollment. Uh, that strikes me, again, as just basic dereliction um, and the inability to communicate with applicants about what is going to serve them best. Um, and once that gets started, w when you have a, um, a culture of presentism, Oh, well, I lost you. Uh, it's true because it's for, what's happening I, now. I, 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 lost, I, lost you first, um, I lost you for a second there. Um, um, and I think that was on my end. So you were, uh, you were saying once you get to a culture of presentism. Presentism. Yeah. Um, when the only thing that happens is what happens in the moment. And uh, also a, um, a culture of self-indulgence. And that's very much the um, culture of higher education in most places. Then um, the, the willingness, the will to say, you need this. This is part of um, what we guarantee to you, your parents, to taxpayers. Um, that breaks down. I, I um, so admired the um, president of, um, of Christopher Newport University, just retired, Paul Tribble, uh, who, giving a speech at ACTA, explained um, how he worked for several years to build a seven out of seven core curriculum. It's actually seven plus um, at a public Virginia university. And when students would come to him and complain about math, he would simply say with love in his voice and in his face, keep taking it until you can get a C in it. You need this. But, and Christopher Newport has done extremely well. It's, its applicant pool keeps burgeoning it's um, it, it, the average SAT score of um, incoming students keeps rising. And interestingly enough, they use the collegiate learning assessment that you had, um, 
had such a role in bringing to the University of Colorado, they use that to measure institutionally how much value they're adding. When we get back to Brown, uh, the question I ask is, what's the value add? And I go back to something that Richard Aram and Josip Araxa exposed in their University of Chicago publication, Academically Adrift, mm -hmm. that the variation in cognitive gain is greater within institutions than between institutions. In other words, the student who takes a cognitively enriching, demanding set of courses in a at an institution that's not highly rated, that doesn't have status, it doesn't have sex appeal, doesn't have great parties, whatever it might be. But the student who does that, or who has the kind of mentors who is going to insist that those things happen, is going to grow more than the privileged person that goes to Brown and drinks for four years. Yeah. <laughs> you know, let's be real. And, yeah, but the per and the person with Brown will have that Brown credential and they didn't necessarily learn as much or grow as much. Yeah. Um, and sooner or later, the bills come due. Uh, privileged people do get a bit of a, um, a boost, but sooner or later, these things do begin to catch up. Um, so that's why we have such a passion about the core curriculum. And that's why we work with schools that want to do better. Hmm. It's interesting. There's been studies on uh, students that struggle community college students in particular, which we are not you, but many institutions often ignore. You and I have spoke passionately about how important community college students are. Uh, and that sometimes a more defined, a prescribed approach to curriculum actually helps them rather than just having a, a, a buffet of, of classes to pick from. I have one last question so we can let you get on with your day. And I like to wrap up all my podcasts with this. And I'd love to ask my guests this, what is it you most like about working in higher education? I, I'm going to go back to Aristotle. What is it that makes us human? In that very famous passage, um, badly uh, misconstrued as man is a political animal. No, man is an animal of the city, of the city state. In other words, man is just a creature without this, the civilization that man builds. And that depends, as Aristotle goes on to tell us, on communication, on the ability to share ideas and thoughts. And that's what higher education is about. It is the transmission of things that are essential, both for the comforts and the security that we have and also for what distinguishes us, what makes life really worthwhile, um, what, what actually makes life worth living. And both of those, both of those elements are absolutely crucial. I, I'm gonna actually fall back on W.E.B. Du Bois in the um, souls of, um, of black people. He said it so eloquently um, the true college will ever have one goal, not to earn meat, but to know the end and aim of the life which meat nourishes. Uh, and that's what higher education is about. Interestingly enough, W.E.B. Du Bois was talking about college at that moment. Uh, and I'll, I'll again um, give a nod to Paul Tribble. Uh, I, I complimented him because I'd been on campus with him and he seemed to know every student that we bumped into by name. And I said, I, I, I'm just, I'm so used to the vacuous presidential wave um, and the, um, the gaze that goes right past the person. And he just looked at me and said, I have 5,000 sons and daughters. And it, it is much akin to parenting. Uh, to be able to help develop minds. And that's not even beginning to get to the important point of, of advancing frontiers. And I also want to give a nod to somebody that you and I uh, worked with, namely Hank Brown, when he was president of the University of Colorado. Um, he modeled 
the life of the mind as well as having such a keen sense of financial accountability and keen political sense. Uh, the very first time I met Hank, um, he picked me up in his small car and um, had to take the uh, teaching company tapes off the front seat because he was always listening to an academic lecture as he drove. And you could see the spirit that that really engendered throughout his leadership team and throughout the, the university people that he met, that he knew what the university was for. It was for advancing people's minds and souls. And that's what keeps me going in this, this particular pursuit, trying to make sure that every college and university is absolutely the best it can be, keeping its prices low so there's good access, and ensuring that the quality of education is the, the highest possible, that it's everything that it could be. And Steve, you were, you were a wonderful person to work with in our time together at Colorado. I, 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 learned, I learned at the master's feet, that's for sure. <laughs> you, you, you modeled what every trustee or regent should be. And I, I hope that your series will help to instill in them that deep sense of commitment and passion and responsibility. Well, uh, Michael, this has been an absolute terrific conversation. Thank you so much for being on the Regents Roundtable and uh, we'll have you on again. Thank you. I, I would look forward to that. Okay. Good to see you, Steve.